and we're pushing it out 55 degrees, that means that we have absorbed about 20 degrees of heat in BTUs. And after that happens, we should see about the same temperature across that coil in latent heat, but by the time it leaves the coil, it is a sensible heat again. And as that sensible gas starts coming back, we are super we we are actually superheating that gas as it comes back because it's nothing but a, a gas now. By the time it gets back to the compressor, it is very important that this is nothing but a solid gas. And we want to and we want to see what the the pressure is with our gauges coming back. We want to see at least 35 degrees coming back. And let's just say if you put a thermometer on the evaporator coil as it's leaving and it, and it comes out to 50 degrees, if it's 50 degrees leaving and it is, let's just say 35 degrees coming back, if you subtract 35 from 50, we're going to have a 15 degree what we call superheat. And 15 degree superheat in an R22 system, if that's what it is, is generally a good temperature drop. And, and the reason that we want to see this superheat temperature change is because it tells you what the efficiency of the system is. If you see in most cases of R22 air conditioning systems, if you see a 15 degree superheat, you're going you're gonna to know that you are doing a good job on your system. You're, you know that, that your whole system is working properly. And the manufacturer of the equipment will tell you what kind of superheat they want to see. Okay. <clears throat> and here's, here's the same thing. And you guys, like I say, can always go back and, and read about this. But here's basically the same thing, but it's actually giving you the temperatures. And I'm not going to go into it in detail right now. But here is the hot gas leaving the compressor. It's getting into the condenser, and you can actually see the change. But it's 125 degree Fahrenheit because of all the heat we picked up from the space in this Freon line. It's 125 degrees. As we remove that heat, we, we might leave that coil and hit 200 degrees Fahrenheit as we're leaving. I mean, as we're leaving the compressor, but we may leave that coil and drop that temperature all the way down to about nine degrees above the ambient air temperature. As we do, it's going to turn into a solid liquid. And so we should actually leave the condenser coil as a liquid. When we come in, hit the meter in the vise, we start spraying. And this this little diagram here shows that we are spraying about 75 percent of liquid and, a, and already as soon as it starts dropping the pressure and coming out into a spray it's about 25 percent gas already. Well by the time it gets all the way through the coil and picks up heat it goes into a solid gas as it's leaving and you can't see this very clearly from where you're sitting but you'll if you're following me on your slideshow it shows that it's about 40 degrees all the way across that coil. So that's a latent heat changing from that 75% liquid into a 100% gas. And so that gas is actually sucked back to the compressor and pushed back out as a hot gas again, and we start the whole cycle over again. So once again, number one main component, number two main components, here's the metering device, number three main component, and here's the evaporator coil, number four main component. Okay. All right. Here's a refrigerator. I'm just going to go through this real quick because we're doing exactly the same thing. Here's your compressor. It is sucking back the cool, low pressure, superheated gas, and it is pushing it out as a hot gas into a condenser coil. If you go home tonight and look under your refrigerator, you'll probably see in almost all the new refrigerators, your condenser coil is going to be right down by the floor. And, you'll, and it'll have a fan on it that's real quiet. It doesn't take much because there's very little Freon pressure in a refrigeration system. The new refrigerators may use uh, 135. Uh, and if 
or 134A, if we're using 134A, we might only see about six pounds of pressure on that, on that Freon. So that's another reason. At, at six pounds of pressure on 134A, it's not much more temperature than the room is to begin with. It's just getting rid of just a little bit more heat. But in doing that, we turned it back into a liquid and we are gonna take that liquid back up to a coil that is going to, to actually be in your freezer section through a metering device, and we might drop that temperature on that coil to zero to, to five degrees Fahrenheit. And we are, first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're, we are gonna cool your freezer section down to let's just say five degrees and we are going to take that cool air and we're going to share it with the refrigerator space itself. And, and this is done by cycling your fan. It may, all the new refrigerators may have a damper section. And as, as we do that, we are once again taking that evaporator, flashing gas and absorbing heat from the freezer section and coming back to the compressor is a low pressure superheated gas and starting the whole cycle again. Here we go again. There's number one main component. Here's uh, number two main components, the condenser coil, probably sitting on the bottom of your refrigerator. The old refrigerator sometimes had that coil in back of them. That was the condenser. Here's the metering device. That's number three main component. And here's your evaporator coil, number four main component. So a refrigerator or a freezer is even a car air conditioner, it's doing exactly the same thing. The Freons will, will make the difference in the temperature. The Freons and the pressures of those Freons will make all the difference in the temperature that, of the space that you wanna change. Okay, here's an example of what a compressor looks like. Here's an example of a, what a good metering device looks like. This is called a thermal expansion valve. We're going to have a seminar on that in about two weeks from a uh, Sporlin uh, rep. And Sporlin is, is one of the main manufacturers of these. But here, here is an example of how this works. Here is the liquid line to the TXV. As the liquid gets to the TXV, we have a bulb that's basically just charged with a little bit of Freon, sensing the temperature on the evaporator coil as it leaves. If that evaporator coil temperature starts warming up, that bulb is gonna pressure up. As the pressure goes up, it's just gonna push this diaphragm down a little bit more, allowing more Freon to, to go into the evaporator. So let's just say you're at a church, nine o'clock in the morning, and all the and the doors open. It's a hundred degree day outside. The doors open for a 9:30 service, and all the people start coming in. Not only are you picking up all the heat from the from the people coming to church, but you're also picking up all the heat because the doors are open. And as that happens, ideally, in a condition like that, where we where we have huge heat loads at different times, we want to use thermal expansion valves because as that happens, this, this bulb right here is going to sense a huge temperature change in that return air. We're going to go from a 72 degree room, we might go to 80 degrees real fast. And as that happens, that evaporator coil is going to be warmer <clears throat> and that bulb is going to sense it, opening this up maybe all the way. And we are going to we're going to just start sh pumping in huge loads of Freon to compensate for that. <clears throat> As the doors close and the <clears throat> preacher starts and everybody is in their place and the temperature starts coming down, thermal expansion valve is going to start cooling down, meaning that the, the pressure is going to be lower. As the pressure lowers, we're going to start backing off on the amount of Freon that we're feeding the, the evaporator coil. And here's the evaporator coil. We have a meter in the, uh, thermal expansion valve right here. We're sensing the temperature of the line leaving the evaporator. So as that temperature increases or decreases, it's going to adjust the amount of Freon flow into the evaporator coil. As you can see right here, we are flashing out of the metering device into a gas at 40 degrees Fahrenheit. 
we continue to pick up heat, but, but as we do, we are absorbing more BTUs of heat, keeping that coil at 40 degrees, but as, it, as that Freon leaves the coil, it's nothing but a solid gas at this point. Now we have that solid gas going back to the compressor. As it leaves the coil, we might see 50 degrees. So after it turns into a solid gas for a little while, excuse me, we're gonna, we're gonna possibly raise the temperature of that Freon line up to about 50 degrees leaving. But as it goes back to the compressor, the pressure is going to drop a little bit more by the time it gets back to the compressor and we might see 35 degrees on our gauges back at the compressor, okay? And when I say we, we're gonna see 35 degrees on our gauges, we're actually gonna see a pressure on our gauge, but we're gonna convert that to temperature. And that's gonna tell us what, what the pressure is or the temperature is compared to what it was coming out of the coil. Okay, here's a good example of a, of a condenser coil. All right, it's, a, it's basically doing the same thing, except a condenser is removing heat an evaporator coil is absorbing heat. So now we're gonna take that hot gas out of the compressor. We're gonna start it at 175 degrees Fahrenheit going in because of all the BTUs of heat that was picked up in the space. And as it goes around the coil, now you're gonna see another latent heat. Getting, we are getting rid of that 175 degree heat and when we get down to about 125 degrees Fahrenheit right here, there's a latent heat going on. We, we maintain 125 degrees in a large section of that coil because it is now going from a, from a hot gas into a, a liquid. And that liquid is actually being subcooled because we are removing that heat. So we're subcooling this hot condenser line. And by the time it leaves, the coil, we have turned into a solid liquid. And we've got to do that once again. We've got to turn that Freon back into a liquid to be able to start the whole process again. All right, so there's your evaporator coil and your condenser coil and what they do. Um, here's just a little chart that shows you the difference in pressures on 410A. Here's 410A at 140 degrees, okay? At 140 degrees, 410A pressure is over 500 degree, or 500 pounds of pressure, okay? At 140 degrees, over 500 pounds of pressure. That's a lot of pressure on these little hoses, so be very cautious on a really high pressure. Um, here's R22 at 140, and it is only a little over 300 pounds of pressure. So R22 is being phased out, but it was a safer Freon to use. All right, here's, here's uh, an example of 134A. 134A, once again, is what we might use in cars or because it's a real low pressure and it's easy to run a compressor in a car or refrigerators or a lot of the ice makers will actually use 134A. And 134A at 29 pounds of pressure is actually going to be 34 degrees. So if, if we're cooling your car, we only have to make 29 pounds of pressure on that Freon to be able to complete the cycle. 